All right. Um, so, title of the long talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about how to. Um, I'm going to talk about how being that uh, bastard guy that Hillary just talked about, the one that tells you how to do stuff. Um, that's what my talk is about. So, um, well, I mean, I'm not here preaching an absolute truth. You make up your own mind, right? But um, this is how I do my data analysis. So, uh, my name is Emil Bay. Uh, I go by Emil Bay's online. I uh, currently am working on a uh, project called Commodity Trader, and what we what, so like um, what we basically do is that we trade uh, grain online. So if you want to buy like 500 tons of grain, like soybeans or whatever, talk to me and I'll ship you like a whole ship of grain. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's basically it. But I mean, um, not too much data analysis in here. Uh, it's actually a lot more about uh, cryptography. Um, so yeah, totally unrelated. Kind of still math though. Um, yeah, I used to study math at, at university, um, mostly because it's like this masochistic thing or like trying to get at the absolute truth of the universe. And um, today I'm also here to talk about absolute truth. So uh, previously, uh, I have a pretty uh, um, varied background. Uh, first, I worked at an advertisement agency as a software developer. Then I've worked at a high performance computing lab, so like a supercomputing lab. Um, I built it was at my university. I built the, um, the Hadoop cluster. And uh, then I've also worked at a daily newspaper as like a data journalist. Or more like um, actu the actual title was uh, editorial developer. So I was like the programmer helping the journalists get at what they're trying to get at. Um, other fun facts, I've been part of a TV show. I was like a hacker dude in like a show where we had to uh, catch people on the run. I've also done a project with some, um, some Syrian journalists trying to um, get back at a, a, a peaceful Syria. Um, they're all in exile in, uh, in Istanbul. That was pretty interesting as well. And uh, I'm also a shark attack survivor. So that's just fun facts. <laughs> okay, first theme on the menu, um, decoupling. So decoupling is a, a Computer, uh, software engineering term, it means to, to take your program and um, try and pull it apart so it's easier to reason about. So, um, oh, contrast is pretty bad in here, but you see the, here we have like a um, kind of shortish program, it's pretty easy to see what's going on or, or like um, get the overview of what's actually going on and if you came into, this pro in a, into a project that had this code, it would be pretty easy to figure out what was going on because there's not that much to it. But uh, then over time, you expand your analysis, and suddenly you're doing more modeling inside your, your project. And uh, over time, it just builds and builds. And I mean, now it's starting to get, oh, well, now it is at a, a, a place where it's, there's so much stuff going on. Like, I mean, you can't even see it on the screen, right? So uh, what can we do about it? Like, I mean, it gets messy, right? Um, doesn't scale well, scale well for human memory. Uh, one thing that Hillary also talked about was that um, human errors are going to happen, so we have to try and uh, build a process around how to prevent these errors. And I know of one that um, you come back at, at a project just even a month after and you have no idea what's going on. So how can we work around this? We can use something from software engineering, something called the Unix philosophy. It's um, kind of like the uh, Ten Commandments of, um, of software engineering. It's a, it's a philosophy developed in, uh, I think, the 60s at, at Bell Labs. The first people uh, building like a timeshare general, general purpose computer, and they were developing an operating system called Unix. Unix, we're still living with the legacy. There's a Unix, Unix legacy inside the uh, Mac OS X or Mac OS. There's a Linux, is also a Unix derivative, and um, FreeBSD and all of these still live by the principles of the Unix philosophy in contrast to uh, the way that uh, Windows have gone. So what is the Unix philosophy? It's uh, write programs that do one thing and do it well. So often you get these small programs that are easy to reason about. It's about to writing programs that uh, can work together. So you can take um, simple operations and compose them into more complicated operations. And um, the, like the third, third tenant is to have programs that work with, uh, with text streams, um, which is something we're going to ignore in the way I do things. So we have this huge program, just one big uh, R file called data analysis.r. 
And uh, what we're going to do to this is we're going to build this graph. It's a directed graph. So like you have these small programs that all do one little task um, well, and uh, you compose them together into like this um, directed graph. And the way these programs talk with each other is through um, exporting data. So you have a very clear contract between what's the output of one program and what's the input of another program. So this is a, the example project um, I put in the abstract. So we have a, um, it's, it's a project about uh, indoor climate at my university. And um, it it's, um, has a couple of parts to it. It has a, a crawler for going and gathering weather data. data. Then it has a uh, import script, so that's like your, um, your stock uh, ETL script, like cleaning up the data and putting it back into a format that you can actually use. Um, then it has like a, a model, uh, a domain model, taking this, uh, this data from the weather data and um, the imported um, readings from the buildings and building this domain model. And um, instead of this domain model uh, file being like one huge script um, that does the, uh, the different types of models we're exploring and does all the plotting and, and exports like all the CSV and JSON files for other people to work with, we decompose it. So how to do that? Uh, so in R, we have these two functions called load and save. Um, and this is basically going to be the, uh, the input and the output of these small programs. The load function will read our data file, and whatever variables you put into that a, uh, a, a, data, a data file um, will appear in your environment when you, you run the command. And uh, you can also save commands, which is going to be the output. So here, uh, this is from the domain model, um, .r file. You can see that we export the, the weather model, and we have the energy model, and uh, which are data frames, and then we also have like um, an auxiliary a building vector, and we write it to a file in the a-data directory. So now, um, the contract between the programs, how the programs communicate each other, how you com like how you build your big analysis, is going to be through these uh, a-data files. Um, you get a couple of nice things from this. Um, your programs become much smaller. All you have to reason, like before, when you have a, like a huge R data program, you'd have to reason about the whole program at once. So you often have a lot of global variables that are all intermediate steps in your analysis. While when you take your, thing, um, take your variables, pick out the important ones, and export them into R data files, you now only have to reason about a very small set of variables. So that um, makes it much easier for new people to come into the project or for yourself to come back into the project after a month you also get some other nice things from, having, uh, from using this technique of, of having intermediate files that save the data. Um, you can checkpoint your computation. So for this analysis of the, uh, the indoor climate, I was running a, a pretty hefty time series model um, that took like um, eight hours to run on my MacBook. And uh, you don't want to do that too often. So you run the analysis once, write it to the A-data file, and now you have the results to continue your analysis. Um, your analysis also becomes uh, reproducible in some sense uh, with some caveats. It's reproducible in the way that you could share the intermediate results uh, with your collaborators, and you have the same starting point. Uh, another property, it's a, it's a fancy word. Uh, how is it pronounced again? Adempotent. Uh, it, it just means that, um, oh well, it, that's how your program should behave, that if you run the program again and again, it should always give the same R data file unless, of course, you change the inputs or you change the code that transforms the, the input data. Um, one problem, though, with, um, with this graph is that, OK, um, so a new person comes into the project, and they have to figure out what the relationship is between all the R files, and they have to figure out to run the R files in the right sequence. Um, for the model to actually work, because now the dependency is no longer on your CSV files or JSON files or web services. The dependencies are now on the A-data files. Um, turns out it's pretty easy to solve, or it's been solved for like, um, what, 50 years now. We can use a tool called make or make files. So, uh, so a make file is, um, is a um, task runner or like a um, declarative wave to say these files come from these commands. Um, 
and that way you can like automate this whole graph. So this is a, a sample R file. You have something called targets. Targets uh, define a output and depend on inputs. And then you can run whatever commands under these targets. So um, the cool thing with this is that um, you have total freedom. So you could run with whatever command you want here. This applies to what, um, whether you're doing Python or R or you're doing bash scripts in between your analysis steps. This uh, applies to, um, to all of those. And it also uh, has another couple of nice properties I'm going to get to in a minute. Uh, but you can compose these targets. So now you can start to build this graph of how things uh, work together in your program. Um, it also has a nice property that if any of your inputs to your targets change, then um, only the targets that changed run will update for you. So um, this is example R file from the project. Uh, at the top, we have the uh, crawl.rda data that I, um, we had on the graph before. It defines its input. So its input to this target is actually the R script, so the program that we're going to run. And you can see that I have the, uh, the command for, for running a um, R file from the uh, terminal. Then we define uh, the next target, which is um, the, the, um, kind of like the first one. It's just the, the other step of the, uh, the graph. And in the end, we have the more advanced target where we have the, uh, the model. And it depends on the two R data files and on the domain model uh, .r. So the cool thing now is that if I ever change the import script, then uh, make will go and look at your file system and it will realize that, OK, I'm missing the, um, or the import .r script, which is a dependency of the R data file has changed. So I can just go in and run those pieces that are missing. Or if I've never had this project on my computer before, I just cloned it from GitHub or got it from a colleague, and I'm trying to get at the, the model.r data file, uh, make will go in and it will look at the um, dependencies and it will figure out, okay, what other targets do I need to run in order to be able to generate this file? So that way you have like a manifest of how to build uh, your whole project and no one needs to run the R data files in a specific sequence. It's proven technology. So like I said, it's, um, this was built before my mom was born. So it has like a, a pretty good uh, track record. It's still state of the art. So if you've ever worked with any, um, maybe you've done scientific computing where you've done something in C or C++, then uh, you probably ran a make file to build that project. And uh, make files are totally underrated because you can use it for any project. Um, in my daily work, I usually work um, on front-end JavaScript. And uh, if any of you have ever like, have worked with front-end JavaScript in the last couple of years, then you probably had to install like a whole sleeve of, of task runners that would manage your project for you. Well, Make has been around for 40 years and these guys are just reinventing the wheel, in my opinion. So here we have a more comprehensive uh, R file from the, or, or Make file from the, from the project. I have a convenience export target at the top. You can see it doesn't have any commands. It just defines what, um, what inputs does it need to do, like does it need, require to run the export target. So that means I can, uh, from my terminal, I can type make export. It will go in and it will figure out how to uh, fulfill those requirements by passing the rest of the file. You can also see I have a clean target. The clean target is for deleting all these intermediate uh, uh, R data files. It's very important that uh, you can start over from any point in time. So you should be able to delete all the, these intermediate data files and reconstruct them again. I mean, that's the whole point of being reproducible, right? So, and, and then it has some, some, other, some other stuff in here as well, right? So yeah, that's the command I'd, I'd usually run if I came into the project and uh, to like build the whole project, I'll just run the, uh, the make export, which is the top, the top command. And uh, if I get into a bad state, so some of my programs start to behave in an uh, unexpected way, um, probably because I messed up one of the files, I'll just clean it all out, delete it all, and export it all over again. How am I going for time? OK. That's just, uh, just uh, one assumption in all this. Um, something that, uh, from a computer science perspective, you call pure functions. So um, the thing with all of this, uh, this, this graph I showed is that this domain model.r can only depend on the inputs I actually give it. 
if it depends on uh, randomness or it depends on the time of the day or it goes out and talks to a web service or something like that, then the model, like this way of computing your models doesn't work anymore because then you have inputs that are not explicit. It doesn't matter over here. Oh, well, it does matter over here, but it, 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 um, because this is the start of your, your pipeline, uh, you have to get input from somewhere. Otherwise, your program doesn't really do anything. So I'll just show quickly uh, pure functions. So uh, here we have a, a function from the project. It's, um, so the project uh, collects data from these energy sensors around different buildings at the university. And uh, you can see we have a lot of stuff going on here. The first couple of lines are, um, they are um, making the URL to go and talk to a web service. Then we go and fetch that URL and we pass the JSON that comes back and then we go and format some of the, um, the data that comes back to the right um, types in R and then return the data. But this function has a couple of issues in my opinion because this is not a pure function. We have the inputs uh, shown at the top but we actually have another input to this function as well that's not explicit. And that's this function here because this function is what you'd call a side effect. It, um, it goes and talks to the web service and it's all right to encapsulate this kind of logic but um, then this is no longer a pure function and we can no longer depend on this function to always give the same results, given the same inputs. So um, for a function to be pure, for a function to be reliable, to be reproducible, it has to fulfill these properties it has to have no side effects, so you can't go and um, change a data frame that you passed in. That has to be explicit. You, um, uh, so that's uh, doing no state mutations. You can also, no side effects does also means that you cannot go and fetch a random number from a random number generator. That is something you'd have to pass in as an explicit uh, input. And uh, the output should be directly derivable from the input. So uh, here's a rewrite of the function. Um, it might seem uh, very pedantic to just take the whole thing and, and split it in part for, for these reasons, but then the, um, the program is a lot easier to reason about when you have a, at the top we have a function to format the URL, so the first part of the, of the last function I showed. So we do that here, read out the, uh, the URL. Then we go and do the side effect, we go and fetch from the web service, and then we have a second function which actually doesn't change the data frame. So we pass in a piece of the data. We are very explicit about the piece of data we pass in. Um, it goes and updates, but it returns it, and we do the mutation. We do the change outside the function because that way we always know where the state changes are. So, I mean, of course, you could just... This would be inside one of the um, initial R files in, in the dependency graph, but... Um, here we are very explicit about where we change stuff and that way the program becomes easier to reason about and you, you, can, you can know that there's nothing going on um, inside any of the functions that will uh, modify your state. And that was actually kind of what I had. Um, so, I mean, that leaves plenty of time for questions, I guess, if anybody has questions. We have five minutes, right? Yeah, we've got several minutes for questions. Okay. That's it. But uh, 